So this talk is about Chainy.js. Chainy.js is essentially a data pipeline for JavaScript. It's like jQuery, but for data. I'm going to go into that a bit more, um, but precisely, why should you care? You should care about this talk if you interact with data at all, any type of data, and you want to write it concisely, intuitively, and very, very nicely. Um, it's like as if you're using jQuery's API, but instead of using just for elements, um, you're using for any data, and it's got none of the bloat of jQuery. So it's got all the good, but without the bad. Now, the other aspect to this is if you also went to the MicroJS movement, so people who hated jQuery, they tried to do MicroJS. But if you did go down that route, um, you would have found that you probably hate the fragmentation. Um, everything, you have like 20 different DOM libraries eventually in your application um, instead of just one. So now, most importantly, um, probably why should you listen to me um, instead of just tuning out right now? Oh, yeah, I can definitely make it a bit bigger. Is that big enough? Yep. Sweet. And all right. So firstly, um, I've created uh, many, many things. Most importantly, or most popularly, is one called HistoryJS. It's become one of the top. Um, 40 JavaScript projects in the world. It's got about, I think, 6,000 or 8,000 stars on GitHub. I also created a static site generator called DocPad. That's one of the top 20 um, CoffeeScript projects. And I've created a, a ton of open source projects as well. So I, I'm quite experienced in, in pumping out a lot of JavaScript code and Node code. Um, primarily, I do this for an open company and community called Bevery. Um, I'm one of the founders. We have two other people on board now. And eventually, th this talk kind of came about because we started running hackathons about every fortnight, um, just online ones. And we were just like, hey, we've got a bunch of members, about 30 or so, and we've got 150 contributors. Wouldn't it be cool if we could actually get a GeoJSON file of everybody, right? So then we could actually get a physical presence and say, hey, look, we've got 20 um, or like a few people in Berlin, right, who are interested in our projects and they want to hack together. Wouldn't that be great? So then I, I actually set out and I was thinking, okay, what about actually creating an automated script to then fetch everybody um, who actually uses, um, who's in our beverage communities, right? So all our different ones. So I actually set out to do this and I was thinking, okay, you know, I could probably do this quite procedurally and, you know, do like a HTTP request, you know, check the callback if, like, if there's an error then output, and then if there's response, then cycle through it. And I realized like this is going to be like a ton of code, and I didn't really want to bother with that. Um, I checked out a library called Highland.js. It's by the guy who does async.js. And I came up with like this script. Um, I'll make that bigger so you can actually read it. And it's about, I don't know, 130 lines. And I expected it to actually work, right? So it's kind of like this underscore chain thing. So these are all the Beverly or the GitHub organizations I was there, um, part of at that point in time. And I want to go through and apply all these operations. But it turned out for some reason, it just stopped working there. And the entire time I, I was coding this, it, it didn't work. And this was like a day wasted. And I, I just couldn't know what was wrong. So I filed like a, a pretty angry issue on his repository as politely as I could. Um, and I said, look, you know, all these things aren't working. Well, you know, what's going on? And then I went to bed, um, and I woke up about 4 a.m., and I was just like, wait a minute. I could probably do this um, myself by tomorrow afternoon or so. Um, so I went and coded up like my ideal way of actually doing this. Um, and then, you know, I then was like, yeah, you know, th this is probably actually possible. I, I can probably do this. So I created this library um, called Chaney. So what is it? Um, Chainy is a chainable data pipeline for JavaScript. It's like jQuery, but for data. It enables you to create a chain, give it some data, then use functions on the chain to work with the data, just like how jQuery works with DOM elements, except Chainy works with any data type. It has built-in support for error handling, flow control, asynchronous and synchronous coding methods, serial and parallel executions, among a bunch of awesome things, while maintaining a concise code base. The functions of the chains are all NPM packages, finally bringing the MicroJS movement to all by making it accessible and intuitive. If you are running Node version 0.11 and above, it even installs some missing plugins for you. So that's one thing you don't have to worry about. When in MicroJS, like, you have to install like 20 different things and it's a pain. 
Um, so this workflow with a combination of jQuery chaining and the MicroJS package style brings a powerful combination of maintainability and intuitiveness, allowing you to build incredible complex app buildings through tiny reusable building blocks with a few more coding style. Now that was a mouthful, but it, it's a good mission statement about what this should actually accomplish. So if we actually look into this, I actually built like a command line tool to make some of these things a bit more easy. So we can install like a, a chainy client, then we'll get started. But at its core, this is what it is, right? You require chainy, you create a subchain, and then you require the plugins you want. Right, so setup and map are just NPM packages. We then set the chain um, to an array that contains some and some data, right? We map through it, and then we just convert each item into the array to uppercase. We apply an action on the entire chain's data. So in this case, we join the array, and then at the end, we output it, right? And we get some data. Um, this one actually doesn't have the exclamation mark. This one does, though. <laughs> so um, I need to fix that. But anyway, right? You know, I just have to add that little exclamation mark there. But if we want to start doing things asynchronously, um, we just give it a completion callback. It can detect how many arguments we actually um, pass um, or are given just using the, the function dot length. So, you know, this time it's like, hey, you know, we've been given item value um, and we've also got next. And so we can now actually do it callback style, right? And then at the end, we got this done and it goes through. Now, if for if whatever reason, if this fails, um, done's gonna like it's gonna pause execution and just you know complete with the error. So we can see this later on, um, but it also works completely on the browser side as well by using Browserify. So if we go back to this GeoJSON example, what would that kind of look like? Now I'm not going to do um, a live coding for this example because I, I've done that before and things have failed miserably. Um, but I can show you that this this works. Um, so if we go through, actually, I'll explain what it does, right? So right now, we require chaining, we create a subchain, require the plugins we're going to use. Now, these are all the different organizations. For each organization, replace them with an API call, right? So map through it. We got the organization name, so here. This name gets replaced, so that will be Beverly here for the first one. And then we can do feed. So feed just fetches the data, and then when it completes, because this is asynchronous, it's just going to um, replace uh, this item in the array once it's actually done. Now, in this case, it's happening in serially, so one at a time. But I can just pass over concurrency zero, um, and that's going to execute them all at once. So I can do all these feeds at once. Now, log is just a convenience method, so I actually get the output at that stage. Now, flatten, um, we've got a bunch of arrays, um, so all the public members um, for multiple things. We can flatten it together, so now we just, instead of having an array of organization arrays of the members, instead we just have one array of all the members. But a user like myself could be in multiple organizations. So let's just call unique, so filter out anyone who does it, who's um, been there twice, right? So we only want to get one pers the person with the same ID once, right? Now, let's actually go through and we'll replace each user um, with the full profile information. So if we actually go here, GitHub's going to just give us a JSON object, um, which is actually going to return a person. But they're actually going to give us a nice little thing, um, this URL, right? So then this is so I can get the full profile information. So for each person, let's go through each one and then get their information again. I can make that happen in parallel um, by just passing over that concurrency zero. So that's good. Now let's get rid of all the users who don't have a location. So you know, let's just keep the ones which have a location. Let's just output how many users there were so we can check it's still working. Now for each person, let's map through them. Um, and then we've got, you know, we want to create a subchain, set the user's location to the value of the subchain, then call a geocode um, function for it. And then once that's done, we want to apply the result to this coordinates field. Now here, we want to get rid of anyone who, whose coordinates failed or the geocoding failed. Here we want to wrap the users now with the, instead of it being the actual user which we got from the GitHub API, now we're wrapping it or replacing it with the GeoJSON example. Here we return or replace all of our change data with the GeoJSON um, wrapper. 
here, stringify it, pipe it to a file, and then complete. So if now, let's say if for whatever reason this fails, it's just going to pause all the remaining stuff and then just go here with the error. So it does like a bunch of interesting things for the actual error handling. Like it wraps everything in domains, like the actions that we fire. So we will catch anything that could possibly go wrong, even if it is asynchronous and running in the background. Um, now, if you have questions along the way, um, let me know. So that's, that's how it works. So if we run that again, that's the initial log statement. It's what we got from each one. I need to make that way bigger for you guys. Oh my God, that's too big. Oh no, it's all right. So firstly, we start with 31 people. Um, then we get rid of the duplicates. So now we've got 24 people. Get rid of anyone who doesn't have a location. Get rid of people who GeoJSON failed. And then we got that completed successfully without errors here because it went through everything. Um, now that's, that's where it gets pretty nifty. Um, is anyone wowed yet? <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Or maybe I've gone way too fast. Um, but the idea here is it's actually a bit more interesting. Um, there's three different types of extensions you can add. So if you're wanting to add your own stuff, um, add extension, this is the extension name, the type of thing it's doing. So an action replaces or performs an operation on the change data. In this case, it's just a log function, right? So we get the current change value and we just output it. If we are doing a set type function, then we'll say add extension, so my set, it gets the current change value and then we can pass it over something else, right? So always our actions are gonna get the change value as the first, but we can pass it over additional parameters. And then if it doesn't accept anything, um, or if it's got like an unknown thing, then it's going to be assumed to be the completion callback. So in this case, we just do a set. There's also different ways we can do it. So like this is the example of a asynchronous one. Um, and there's utility extensions and a bunch of different ones, right? Now, this is, if you're not used to working with data, this probably isn't that impressive. Um, but there is an interesting use case for this. Um, so this is something where, for whatever reason, I had to get the chains, um, all my Git branches um, in my current directory as an array, right, to use in, in um, a node script. So instead what I did was I created a chain, required the, these plugins, so I set it to the command I wanted to execute. Then I executed the command. Now this is the result of the command. So this like beats the child process stuff, um, in my opinion. Um, so then like I replace that, so that's the current one. I can replace like or anything that isn't the actual branch names and then split it. So now I've actually got an array. Um, this is the example of the same thing, but now it actually deletes the remote branches except for master, right? Um, so that was the actual script I want to use. But we can go a bit further, right? Um, this is an example of like an API server I've coded. It's using Redis. But initially I want to, that's all right. All right, now if we, this just imports like all of our, our JSON data, um, our fixtures into the actual database. So we'll create a new chain, set it to like star. So then now we forward the star as the first argument to the Redis keys method. Now this is gonna return all the keys in our, in our Redis database. And then we just trickle all those keys now to the delete things. So now we've got a new clean database. Now for each fixture, um, we'll have the rows, the table name, and we want to go then create a new chain, set it to the rows, um, convert them into an a array of the ID and then the data for, for that row. And then we can do the HM set, so combine it all together. And then eventually just apply how many stuff we actually injected and then execute it all concurrently. So that's like an example of doing like a, a you know, erase everything then dump things in. As an actual API server, this is for instance if we find some data um, so let's return everything that, that isn't in our rsqs table. So we'll create a new chain, set it to rsqs, we'll get everything inside it, we'll decode the table, which is just a simple JSON decode on every item in it, um, and then we're done. And then this is using Feathers.js, which is like a wraparound express. So that's just gonna send back the resulted, um, well the result or the error that it handled, and then Feathers is gonna take back, you know, take control of that. We're gonna do the same thing, um, just with a single one, which we're given. Or at the same time, we can create stuff in a, in a similar way. Um, 
But ideally, if this isn't just limited to this, um, we've got, if I show you like a few of the plugins we've done so far, they're all just on NPM. We've got a few. Um, the Grok one's really nifty. Um, I like that a lot. So do 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 it. So I'll just show you, for instance, what the Grok plugin would look like. Do 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 Glob. Sorry, the Glob plugin. So that's like the Glob plugin. It's pretty easy. Ideally, you know, I just like to get rid of that. So this is just saying Glob. It already accepts the change data as the first thing or the value we want to Glob, and then it's going to do a completion callback return, right? And then we're just saying that's an action. If we're doing, um, what would be another good example? Piping, right? Um, here's one, so we get the change data, we get this output stream we want to do, and this completion callback. So we'll get this pass-through stream, um, and we'll just convert the data, um, or we'll write the data, uh, our change data, to the pass-through stream. I, I forgot to take some water. I'm <laughs> running out of water in my mouth. Um, but yeah, once it's done, then we just call the completion callback, and we're good. So. That's it. I'm just going to check if there's anything I didn't actually cover. Yeah, we covered all that, covered all that, covered all that. Now, a big use case of this is, um, so Docpad is the static side generator I wrote. It's actually like the most popular one for Node.js. Um, we actually maintain like a listing as well of all the different static side generators. So let's see if we sort them by stars. But the thing with Docpad is it's become pretty big. Um, over time, it's probably maybe like 2,000 or 3,000 lines of code. And the issue um, that I'm trying to solve here is that, um, thank you, um, is we're using Chainy, it solves this issue, right? Because it forces you to write these tiny little things. Like every single plugin is probably like at least 50 lines or less. Um, and when you publish those plugins to NPM afterwards, you know, you can really start compiling this thing and they all speak the same context, which the MicroJS solution didn't solve. So for this, it's actually like a point where instead of doing something where we have a Grope coffee script plugin, a Grunt coffee script plugin, um, a Broccoli coffee script plugin, a Docpad coffee script plugin, um, we could actually probably have something where it's just a coffee script plugin and then that actually works with Chainy and then Chainy can be implemented in the other things because it is so ridiculously low level. So I'm actually quite excited about the, the possibilities of this in, in the future. And one of the other aspects which is quite nifty about this is if we actually check out the roadmap. Um, one of the big aspects of people who haven't probably written that much node code before um, is let's say if I write, let's say for low dash, right? Or underscore, this is probably a better example with underscore. If I update like the, um, the flatten method, then I have to publish a new version of underscore. And then everyone has to bring in that new version of underscore. When with this, because everything is its own thing, that flatter method will be finished for the rest of time. You only have to install it once. And things will only be updated as they actually need. So it is quite interesting. Anyone who followed Substack's talks, James Halliday, um, he's the browser of Fire Guy, would probably understand um, that bit. So at least that's the end of the official talk. Um, I'll open that up to questions right now. It, it's probably a bit mind blowing. Um, at least for myself, it was. Yeah. Seems really cool. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering. It looks like you're dealing with um, finite depths. Uh, yeah. Extreme stuff, maybe different stuff with you know, an infinite depths set and things you know, don't know actually how they go. Yeah. Like yeah. So at least in this example, right, like it, Chaney does not care at all what that value is, right? You can make that a stream. Um, and then you could write actions for it that then use that stream. We don't care. It could be a jQuery DOM element. And then you just say require the jQuery bundle or like a DOM bundle. And then suddenly you have the jQuery API implemented these tiny little functions. So at least from Chaney's perspective, like Chaney is literally like, I think, 400 lines of code in terms of the core. So we really do not care at all. Um, 500, it's grown a bit. Um, so it's 500 lines of code, and, and I hope that one day this, this core will be finished. Um, these days is pretty early. This is probably the 10th week of it actually being out, um, or at least since its inception. So it's got like some growing to do, but you know we don't care what the value is. You can make that whatever you want and then write the actions on it. it it's more like that chaining um, style, which I'm bringing. Yeah. So if you have a, a large event, so you just look at those events. So yeah.
Alrighty. Cool. Thanks, everybody.